What is going on, guys? It's Sean O'Connell, the managing director here at Cinema Blend and the co-host of the Real Blend podcast with Jake Hamilton and Kevin McCarthy. And this week, we were able to sit down with Josh Trank, who was coming off of uh, both Chronicle and the Fantastic Four, but then a long layoff before he decided to come back with a passion project in Capone, which stars Tom Hardy as Al Capone. But it's definitely not the uh, type of gangster film that you're used to seeing. It's not Capone uh, at the high point of his criminal career. It's the final day days of Al Capone, and they are uh, <laughs> really bizarre, uh, really bizarre. But Trank and Tom Hardy lean into that fully uh, to come up with this biopic that's, you know, a, a little bit filtered through Kubrick, a little bit filtered through David Cronenberg, and really shows off who Dr- Josh Trank is becoming uh, as a director and a storyteller. And again, it's just a gonzo performance by Tom Hardy, which uh, I cannot recommend highly enough. It's available on video on demand uh, as of right now. You can you can find the movie right now and, and give it a chance for yourself. So we asked Josh to come on the show to open up about the process of uh, getting Tom Hardy and putting him through the ringer to play Al Capone in his final days. Uh, so we broke this off as a bonus episode and wanted to bring it to you guys right now. So without further ado, uh, press play on the Real Blend podcast interview with Josh Trank for the new film Capone. I'll get us in. All right, well, uh, this is an absolute pleasure. Josh, thanks so much for joining the show. It's so good to see you. Uh, obviously, you know Sean and Jake. Uh, just thanks for being here, man. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, we've all watched the film, and I want to start off with uh, your title card placement in this film. I believe it was like 12 minutes in, into the film, you you pop up the Capone title card. I just thought that was such an interesting way to do that. Um, in the beginning of the film, you actually have... You have your logos pop up, you have your presenting logos pop up, and then you start the film. And then 12 minutes later, we're, we're, we're on that beautiful water shot as the Capone logo comes up. And I just wondered from a filmmaking perspective, what is the choice there um, to break the film for a second? Give your title card 12 minutes in. What, what is that? What are, you, what are you trying to say as a filmmaker when you do something like that? Um, uh, you know, I, I, I one of my favorite uh title introductions of all time is raising Arizona. And I just remember this, that like just wonderful introduction of these characters and the world that they lived in and, uh, you know, their circumstances. And it just kind of like ended on this like beautiful culmination of like what their lives could, could become at that moment. And then the music hits and it's raising Arizona, but it was really fun. I don't remember how long it was into the film, but it was long enough to where, for a moment, you kind of forgot that you even needed to know what the movie was called, but it just like happened at the right mm-hmm. moment. And um, I, when I was writing the script, I don't think it was like a so much of a conscious decision of mine where I was tr- I was trying to emulate that vibe. Although the Coen Brothers are one of my like top five most like biggest impacts on on my life creatively and just emotionally on, and on every level. So it might've just been like a subconscious thing as I was writing it, but it felt like the right moment in the script to, I wrote in title, title cards, Fonzo. Um, And I remember nobody, nobody brought it up really from the script And when we were shooting it, like it wasn't a thing. But when I did my first cut and I showed it to everybody, that's when everybody noticed like, wow, it comes up right there. And I kind of like it it. for some reason. And I'm like, I like it, too. I, I, you know, it just feels emotionally like the right thing to happen at that moment because he's. But is it weird? Is, Is it weird seeing Capone pop up versus the original Fonzo title? Does that like change it at all for you? I was uh so. So for those who don't know, um, uh, you know, I, I wrote this movie about maybe four and a half years ago. Um, it's been called Fonzo for this entire time up until just a couple of weeks ago, uh, or I guess maybe a month ago, a month and a half ago. So everybody who's been following the movie and the making of the movie, I've been pump, pumping out on my social media uh, Fonzo, Fonzo, Fonzo. I mean, I would like a lot of my friends, uh, hit me up with like random pictures of just random things and say Fonzo, because I would be like (laughs) posting up pictures of like Pete and Pete or something like that. And just saying Fonzo, like anything, it just applies. So anyway, when we screened the movie for a series of distributors last summer, um, it was a slightly, uh, it was the last version of, 
uh, it was the last cut that I made before my final cut. So it was like maybe a little bit longer. Uh, there were certain scenes that ran on a little bit longer, um, some score in some different places. Um, we screened that version for distributors as Fonzo. Everybody passed on it. And I mean, I was, I was clearly, I was very uh, heartbroken about that um, and confused, but it made sense to me. Like, you know, for the price that I, I feel maybe the studio is asking for. And also just like, you guys have seen the movie. Um, by the way, can everybody see me? Okay. Am I like too dark? Am I okay? Okay. You're fine. So yeah, for you're good. the, the price that it was, uh, they were, they might've been asking for. And also just the content of the movie itself. It's not like a easily definable genre type of a film. It doesn't fall into one of yeah. the like five, kind of like pre-made categories of, of marketing where it's like, it's, it's a thriller clearly, or it's a, a prestige Oscar drama or something. Um, I think everybody's just like, uh, too risky. And I don't know. So, uh, I was asked by the studio if it was okay that if they brought on another editor, that somebody who I would trust or somebody who I had respect for that could lend a fresh set of eyes to see if there was possibly a more commercial version of this film. And my initial reaction for about like maybe five minutes was just utter anxiety because yeah. it had brought up all these old memories. But then I very quickly reminded myself that, you know, this isn't the same situation that I once found myself in. This is a group of people who have only shown me love and support for, you know, at that point, you know, three and a half years had been so wonderful and gracious during the process. So if anything, I felt, you know, even though deep down in my heart, I knew as an editor um, that there is really no way that you can edit this movie to make it more commercial in any way, because just the substance mm -hmm. of it is, I mean, you know, spoiler alert, there's diapers involved in this film. I don't know how you can make a more commercial version of a film where the second half of the movie, uh, t Tom Hardy's wearing diapers. Like it just, I don't know what you do with that. So, but I could just be too close to it. Maybe there is this different version of it. So um, I owed it to my partners and those who had supported me through the process to see if per their investment, if there was a better, better, more commercial way to do it. We tried it. We brought on an editor. Um, she, you know, did, did her best job. And, and ultimately it just was very clear that there really isn't a, there's a different version of this movie, but there's not a more commercial version of this movie. And the different version of that mm. film was not a version of the film that resonated with me or resonated with t Tom Hardy or anybody. So we, um, you know, uh, they were like, all right, well, it's going to be my cut. Let's see if the, there's another distributor that is uh, willing to get behind this film and be passionate behind it. And so I was very lucky by January. I think it was like end of January, beginning of February that uh, Vertical came in and they watched the film. They were extremely passionate about it and was uh, really lucky. Um, they said, that, you know, they wanted to release the movie in theaters between three to five hundred screens uh, in May and that we would have like a nice window in theaters before our uh, before VOD release. Um, but the and it was going to be my cut. But the, the only compromise that they wanted from me is that uh, the film would be called Capone. And again, mm. my first my first reaction for about five minutes was anxiety because I have had so much joy over the last many years saying Fonzo over and over again, just everybody loves the name of it. It's just a fun name. And I talked to like, you know, some people are closer project. Everybody's just like, but it's Fonzo. And I'm like, I know, but <laughs> it's always Fonzo to us. And, you know, there's a possibility that in some of the European markets, it'll still be called Fonzo, which is is fun. Oh, and, cool. you know, so but to, I'm sorry, the most long winded answer ever to your question oh, right. about how did I feel seeing the name Capone as opposed to Fonzo? Uh, well, I, wa I rewatched the movie after my conversation with Vertical and it didn't say Capone yet because it was still just the cut that I had from my, you know, from my quick time. So I watched it and I pretended that it was called Capone. I didn't see the name change yet, but I was just like, what if this was a movie called Capone? And I got a different, it was like, just, it worked in its own way because the fact that it's called Capone almost adds a different, a it adds a different level of, um, 
sort of, I, I hate to say it because it's a film about such tragic, you know, with such tragic themes at, at its center, but it adds a different level of sort of comic irreverence to it that it's called mm. Capone. Um, yeah. And also I, I noticed something that had never really hit me before in any point during the film, because the name of the movie was called Fonzo. It's not anything. The fact that you only hear the name uttered Capone, Al Capone, right before those credits hit and right up to that moment, we've gotten to know this character that Tom Hardy is playing up to this point with nothing but like warmth and this like grandfatherly energy running around playing with his kids. Everybody loves him. People are like, you know, concerned about him. They have this beautiful Thanksgiving together and there's just, it's all this love. There's no sense of like, he's a gangster or anything. I mean, sure. He's Tom Hardy. He looks imposing. He looks like he could be intimidating, but he's not giving off that vibe. We just know that he's a bit sick. So when the name Capone comes across, suddenly this theme of Mm. Uh, identity and one's own relationship with their identity and the name that bears their identity to themselves and to the world is put up there right front and center. And so when I did finally, I, and I watched the, you know, when they inserted the slug of being Capone and said Fonzo, I'm like, you know what, this really works in a way I didn't expect. So I don't necessarily know if that makes it better that it's called Capone. Maybe it, maybe it's the, uh, one of the best things that ever happened that it's called Capone, but huh. it's it certainly gotten a lot of people's attention that it's a movie called Capone. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Cause there was a line that we were talking about before we even hopped on this, where when it, they, he is called Capone in the movie. And I think it's Linda Carlini's character where she's like, well, look, we don't say that. Yeah. Name. Right. You know, and when that comes across, I was like, Oh, that even has more meaning to it. Knowing about <laughs> right, the right, today. right, right. Yeah. So it, it took on <laughs> yeah. its own, it's taken on its, it, 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 um, it hasn't taken away from the movie. Like I, my big fear is that it was going to be so on the nose that it would almost cheapen yeah. the, the integrity of what we all set out to make together. And I, I don't, mm-hmm. I, I feel like it's just taken on a new life. So. Uh, yeah. Josh, we, I mean, here on the show, pay a ton of attention to directors who we admire. And obviously um, based on your early film Chronicle, we were uh, couldn't wait to see what Josh was going to do next and, and track your career all the way through. Uh, you were in a bad spot necessarily. Um, and but we were all very curious about like, okay, well, what is he going to do next? How does he come back from this right. kind of thing? And I'm sure you were wondering that a lot too. So I'm really curious what, what it feels like. How does it feel when you get someone like Tom Hardy to commit to a project that it's a lifeline thrown to you, yeah. I would assume where you're like, good, I'm going to get to make this now. I'm I, it's, it's going to yeah. come to fruition when I'm assuming you were in some uncertainty for a long period of time. Sure. Um, you know, uh, I, the, the process of, uh, Tom getting involved in the movie, um, it was so much simpler than any, th- than I would have ever imagined it would have been. Um, I, I wrote the script. I didn't think of any actor while I was writing the script because I was so, my soul was just so baked into just these characters as being characters. And to be quite honest, I, there was no, I didn't have any sense, any confidence in myself that this is something I would actually be able to go make. So I didn't think about actors. I just was like, mm-hmm. I want to write, I just want to write this as if it's just that maybe people will just read it, you know? Um, so once I finished it and then I read it back the first draft, it just, I was like, there's literally nobody else on the planet who could play this character other than Tom Hardy. Um, you know, it's, it's a really complicated character, but there's a, there's a level of absurdity within all of the drama and, and within this very grounded character and he goes to so many different places and there's so much humility required in a, in a character who faces like this, like kind of deconstruction of masculinity from the start of the picture to the very end. He's being, he's unraveling in his, in his masculinity. And Tom Hardy is the only actor I can think of who on one hand embodies the most ultimate symbol of masculinity that I think any of us can, can imagine. And at the other, and on the other end, he's somebody who is so willing to show himself 
in his most in the most naked and vulnerable state. You know, like when you watch a movie like Bronson, it's it's right there. I mean, what a, an incredible powerhouse performance that movie yeah. he what you know he had in that film. Like to show himself as like this like you know brash you know bad motherfucker just beating the shit out of people left and right in every type of circumstance with every imaginable tough guy. And then he's also like naked and crying and alone and sad. Who else has really put that on film that we can think of to that degree? Like we've certainly seen a lot of like, you know, masculine actors break themselves down on screen in interesting ways, but like in such a manner where they're also holding themselves with this like bravado. So Mm -hmm. I was like, obviously that would be the dream to, for, for it to be Tom Hardy. Um, so I finished it. I went through a, another few drafts of it until I was ready. Um, my bank account was rapidly d- dwindling at that point because of just, I had so many expenses that happened during the end of fantastic four and just libel attorneys from all these stories that were coming out about me. And it was just, so I was, I needed some, I needed some cash in my pocket. So our, our two producers that were working with me, um, we needed to get an, uh, find somebody who's willing to, uh, pay an option on the script, um, to give me some money, uh, so that mm-hmm. I could survive a bit during our, uh, um, our, our search for the, the lead. Um, and it's a very, it's a difficult thing to ask because usually what you want to do if you've written a spec script, um, or for, you know, those who are watching this and don't know, it's when you write a screenplay, um, not for money, just for yourself. And you're just putting it out there in hopes of getting paid mm-hmm. for it or getting an actor attached to it. But the, the best mm-hmm. thing that you, you could do with a spec script is to, um, get, uh, your actors attached to it first. If you're in a position to, to get to those actors before the, before you get the financing, because typically when you get financing and by the way, this is in no way, shape perform to paint any, you know, financers or anybody like that is like, you know, the bad guys to the creative process. But, you know, there is a different level of neuroses involved when people come in with money to pay for something because they want to then understandably so lend their voice to the process so that, you know, they can say like, okay, well, this script is this or that. And, you know, if we want to get these actors, maybe we should make these things. So we wanted to try to find a a financer who is willing to put an option on it, but not, um, a a bit, try to bend the script creatively or anything. Cause we me myself, John Schoenfelder, Russell Ackerman, my two producers, we loved it. So Lawrence Bender came along, um, who is everybody knows, you know, that's, I love seeing his name yeah. pop up. I haven't seen his name since like yeah. Pulp fiction yeah. and reservoir yeah. dogs. What a great, it's a name, great name man. when it pops up. You're like, oh. it gives you a level of, you're like, okay, there's a lineage, it's validity. there's a lineage here, you know, like, yes. so he read it, he loved it and was just like, wrote a check for me. It was a, to keep me going for basically just the rest of the year, because, you know, the thing is, it's like, it, You know, when you're working freelance, especially in like our industry, if you're a writer, director or something like that, your life has to be 24 hours a day, seven days a week committed to getting your movie made. And that Mm. creates a, a schedule that's pretty unorthodox, you know, like you have to be willing to like get up and get on a plane or go anywhere at any moment's notice. So you, if you're in a position where you're like, okay, trying to set up a movie, you can't be doing anything else. So the kind of check that you need for that is just like, this is going to pay your rent for the next like half year. Right. So during that time, we, you know, started like putting out feelers to different actors and stuff like that. And you know, weren't really like hearing anything back. And it was kind of like, okay. And again, and maybe in a little bit of a situation similar to like when we eventually screened the movie for distributors, because it is a a tough sell. And, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, eventually uh, Tom Hardy's agent read the script and he came to us and said, Hey, Tom has an opening next year. And I have a feeling he's going to really dig this script. Would it be all right if, uh, you know, I passed it on to Tom. And I mean, my answer was like, absolutely. Like, I, uh, <laughs> please. And my expectation was nothing. Cause I didn't want to, I didn't want to get my hopes up because I, I love Tom Hardy and I like, I'm such a huge fan of his. I wouldn't want to be let down by that. So I was like, all right, well, you know, we'll maybe we'll hear something back. Maybe not the next day I get a call. 
Tom has already read the script. What? He's already read the script and he wants to know if he can get your phone number, hop on the phone with you tomorrow. And I'm like, yeah. Wow. And I mean, my heart is like beating out of my chest. And Tom calls me up on my phone the next morning and we were on the phone for about six hours or so, maybe longer. It was, it was an entire day long conversation. Um, wow. And we just, I don't know, we just connected from the minute that we got on the phone. It was like just any, any amount of like, you know, the, the myth of, you know, Tom Hardy, the, you know, Bane, uh, Bronson, the craze, you know, all of these characters and just the, what he exudes. It just, it was just Tommy. So anyway, um, you know, we just, Tom and I just, we clicked, uh, he's just the sweetest, nicest guy. There's no, he was just from the minute I heard his voice, he, he, just, I think he said to me, he's like, he's like, Oh no, did I wake you? And that's not what I expected from <laughs> Bane to call me up and be worried that he might've stirred me from a slumber, you know, from my gentle slumber. And he's, did I wake you? Oh, I'm, Oh, Oh mate. I'm so, I'm just like, <laughs> No, you didn't at all. I've been like up since four in the morning, actually. And we just started talking and we got in his script. He just loved it. And just he loved how weird it was. And just the, the 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 journey of the character. And it was like, like I said, I mean, the process of getting Tom Hardy involved with this script was much simpler than I would have ever expected. And then and what I really learned from this experience is like, you know, the right material getting to in the hands of the right people who understand that material, it's it, it makes things very simple. Like people want to people want to have a stage to, you know, do the work that they they dream of doing. And, and when yeah. that material comes to their comes across their table, like that's, you know, what else are they going to do? But j go for it. You know, so, yeah, that's from from there on out. It was basically we were on the phone forever he asked if I could come out to London and Lawrence Bender and, uh, and John and Russell, they threw, threw down some money for a ticket for me. I flew out there, hung out with Tom for a week and a half. And, uh, we, it was just like instantaneous BFF type deal. And, you know, we talk every day and we've become very, very close friends and collaborators and we just had the best time making the movie. Uh, Josh, I am talking to you from Chicago and this city obviously has a very interesting relationship with Al Capone in that if you go to any tourist shop on any corner, every single one has a corner dedicated to Chachki's like almost idolizing Al Capone. You get Al Capone t-shirts and picture frames and shot glasses and mugs. And the city itself has always sort of had this weird vibe of like, are we weirdly idolizing this guy? And what's our relationship with him? But people love associating Al Capone with Chicago. So I guess the point I'm asking is just sort of this idea of as, as a pop culture icon, do we weirdly idolize him? And with your film, we look at him so differently than we've ever seen him before. But is there a degree of, of forgiveness or redemption or, or add, or are we sort of giving more credit to a monster than, than he deserves? You know, I, it's funny. I wish I, I could say I had the answer to that because it's, I mean, it's a big question. And I think if I had, um, I haven't spent that much time in Chicago myself. I've been to Chicago a few times. I've definitely walked about the city and, and I've seen some of this, you know, the iconography of, you know, for sale that you've, you, you're talking about, like I've seen mm -hmm. this, but I, my relationship isn't, isn't the same, um, as if I were living in Chicago. So, you know, the way that I've always perceived Al Capone is in my mind, I mean, grew up with this, like the Edward G Robinson kind of like, you know, original Scarface, kind of character and somebody who interestingly enough we have no recordings of his voice we don't know what he really sounded like which is comes to a, another interesting conversation about that and how we were you know going about the voice and stuff but you know it, i think as far as like his image as a gangster and like are we idolizing him too much i don't think that I don't think I, I, I don't think that this movie should stand as a um, as a as a lesson to give to people for like, you know, you shouldn't worship a person like this. But I think it's enough to make them question how they're worshiping somebody like that, Yeah, because I've always been fascinated by not the myth, but the deconstruction of the myth, you know, like I, I I'm not so interested in 
you know, Julius Caesar, like leading, you know, his legions up north to conquer the rest of the world. Like I'm more interested in just, I don't know, like his, um, his irregularity and his like, you know, like his bowel regularity, like for some reason that's interesting to me because <laughs> yeah. immediately it humanizes str- him. It humanizes him. Cause I'm thinking about him. his, his, it, you know, no longer the myth, but just like human issues that he faces that any one of us can relate to that in many ways probably had more to do with if I don't know if Julius Caesar had bowel irregularity, but <laughs> if he did, some of the things that he did in his life would probably have had more to do with those very human aspects of his life than we would want to give it credit for. Because people want to just assume that if, the, you know, whether it's like, you know, George Washington or Julius Caesar or Al Capone or one that they were just these powerful, you know, uh, Theodore Roosevelt. I, I worked on a script about him and that was a great a great exercise and also just deconstructing the myth and like, who is this person? What drives this person? But mainly what are the obstacle, the human obstacles that this person is overcoming that any one of us could look at and be like, Oh, okay. You know? So with Al Capone, you know, I, I think that there is definitely a, like America has a weird fascination with violent, with with like vi- violent criminals like yeah obviously we watch netflix you know? specials yeah yeah like we just have a fascination and i mean i think that there's an exploitative element to a lot of those kinds of documentaries i enjoy them just like everybody else but i also feel a little ugly afterwards you know like yeah, yeah, yeah. it's just like because i mean especially even with the show like uh and this is no you know like i mean obviously uh narcos is or uh, you know it's like it's a great show and everything like that. But I watch something like that and I just even feel like, I don't know, like I don't really feel like I've learned anything more than what I already knew. It's just like, right. OK, yeah. there is a show yeah. about it, you know, like it's cool. And yes, Pablo Escobar, dope Pablo Escobar. But I don't know. I'm just not interested in that. Like I just, I mm. you know, I, I want to sort of see where those problems come into their lives. So for somebody like Capone, Uh, You know, I didn't start writing this movie because I wanted to make a movie about Al Capone. I wrote this movie in the sort of the the wake of uh, Fantastic Four. And, you know, I I was the reverberation of the massive atomic blast that was the release of that film and my tweet that I made and deleted and all that. I was had gone from. A place in my life where I experienced for a couple of years what I, you could only describe as like the height of success of success in Hollywood, and yeah. and it was for me a, a, a it was a surreal experience. Like I wish I could say that I was more emotionally equipped during that experience to have sort of you know to say because nobody wants to hear that you had like a, your first movie came out and it was number one and it was successful and you were super emo about it. Like nobody wants <laughs> to hear that. Like that's really annoying. I mean, it's yeah. annoying for me to hear about it, but I was, I wasn't ready for it and it all kind of freaked me out, but in a way that I was too stubborn to ever want to admit to anybody that I wasn't ready to sort of like go through that odyssey. But I was, I had it and I, I, I had all these huge projects and involved with like, I felt like I was, you know, when Star Wars episode seven, few years before it came out, I knew that Han Solo was going to die. Hmm. I was walking around. I was walking around for two years because I was working on Star Wars. Oh, I was there. Luke. Yeah, I was. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I was working (laughs) on, on a Star Wars movie going up to Lucasfilm for two years, two and a half years before that movie came out. And I so I knew for two and a half years that Han Solo was going to die in the new Star Wars movie at a time when everybody was clamoring for ins- any any inside info. And they kept a really yeah. good tight lid on that. The reason being is the fear of God. Like <laughs> I was terrified the minute that they told me what was uh, going to be the stories going on with the Star Wars films. I like almost didn't want to know. I wanted to unknow it as soon as I found out. Cause it's terrifying information. I also felt like I like, I can't tell anybody this, this is too powerful of information. So I was in this headspace for a long time and then suddenly fantastic four comes out and I'm just 
alone in eerie silence in my backyard. Nobody wants to talk to me, let alone give me all the most powerful secrets behind what's going on in all these big franchise movies. There's no money coming in. I'm toxic. Um, I'm, I'm, you know, like I said, I'm running out of money. Um, all of my relationships in my life had just sort of ended. And I was sitting out there for a couple of months, just chain smoking cigarettes and just confused with my own identity from having spent the last many months of my life reading stories about me that I myself didn't really recollect the same way. Right. Um, and at one point it was just a seed in my head of stories that I had once read about Al Capone, um, a couple of years after he was released from uh, Alcatraz due to his health issues and how he was just sitting alone in his backyard, puffing on a cigar hmm. alone with his whole life of being Al Capone so far behind him and nothing to identify him in his current, you know, in that current situation as being the Al Capone that we would have known him as. And because of his, you know, the, the mental deterioration that was going on in his mind at that time, I just kept thinking about what would it be like to be Al Capone in that moment if he flipped on the radio hmm. and heard a radio play about Al Capone yeah. right. with that Edward G. Robinson voice and all of those things like what would be his emotional response to that? Yeah. And my yeah. my gut told me his emotional response to that would be fear. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Josh, you, you said something just now that I want to follow up on only be, I was I was getting ready to actually jump into the stabbing of the neck question because I want to know yes. how the hell you got that got that past the MPAA. But I want to follow up on something you just said about learning about Han Solo's death. Um, I'm curious because that, that's basically spoiled for you, essentially, because you don't get to experience yeah. it with the audience when we experience it. Under what circumstances are you told that information? And like, like, did JJ tell it to you? And, and also... How did how did that death affect the possible Star Wars movie you were making? Well, I've been asked uh, in the last couple of days uh, by ma many people in a, a lot of the, the press interviews for Capone about th this kind of stuff. Like for me, it's very hard to like what was really hard for me working on those movies and all those kinds of movies is like naturally I'm not the kind of person who wants to hold secrets from people. I like to be very transparent. Um, I, I know that everybody loves these things too, and I want to share it. So I wasn't in a position where I could have told anybody anything then. And it still kind of applies now because of the amount of NDAs and the language within those NDAs. So yeah. I'm very careful about knowing what aspects of what I can say or like things that people already know. Like for instance, we already know that Han Solo died. All I can say is it wasn't JJ because I never interacted with JJ. I the only time I'd met JJ is when I'd uh, I was lucky enough to have a set visit to hit, meet him on his uh, Star Wars Into Dark uh, Star sorry Star Trek Into Darkness, mm -hmm. um, which had nothing to do with anything prior to you know him doing Star Wars. But um, I uh, you know it was through my working with Kinberg and Kiri Hart and all, all of my friends at Lucasfilm, who I'm still very close with, and. Um, in terms of any of the uh, aspects of what I was being told was going to eventually be a part of the canon of the new Star Wars film, it would, of course, in some way, shape or form, have an impact on knowing what the parameters were for how those choices mm -hmm. would affect the overall universe of Star Wars in the same way that, you know, if there's a, a pandemic, how that affects Th things in our world and somewhere else. And, you know, just it, because Star Wars, the universe of Star Wars, it's a bri big breathing living universe. And there's all kinds of things that, you know, domino effects. So it, I, you know, it, it, there, there, I don't think that there were that many effects to it, but it was definitely shocking to find that out. I yeah. mean, I was like, okay, because I got the the way that I found it out had nothing to do with the experience of learning it emotionally and watching a film. I was just told it as if I was told my dog died. I'm like, okay, well, what do I, what do I do? Yeah, I had to just deal with it. Uh, it's horrible, That's crazy, horrifying. Um, Josh, we have about 10 minutes left and we really don't want to go over because your PR reps have been really nice to extend your time with us. Today. Sure. So, yeah, um, of course. Maybe we'll just rifle through um, a couple of really quick ones. Um, of course. I wanted to sort of follow up on um, 
you mentioned in this, we all read the Polygon piece that came out earlier. It was really informative, a really deep dive into your career. And you mentioned how you had um, Robert Rodriguez as a mentor, someone you can call uh, and and then give you some sort of spiritual guidance, really walk you through. Um, you've had some amazing experiences and can pass that down to the next up and comers. I'm just curious if if you were to be Robert Rodriguez to someone else who is coming into the industry, uh, what might you tell them? What advice might you give them to to balance them as they came into the industry and, and tried to stay in it? Two things. Always, always, always follow your heart and don't ever be afraid to ask for help. Mm-hmm. That's it. There's no shame in asking for help. And I, the first part about following my heart, that's something that I never had any problem with. The second part is the thing I've always had a problem with is asking yeah. for help. I'm, okay. I've, I'm a very stubborn person. And I think yeah. that, I think a lot of filmmakers by nature were very stubborn because that's our life is, you know, putting, put telling our stories in our specific way. But like, you can't, you can't be afraid to ask for help. It's the most human thing that anybody yeah. can possibly do. We are not, we are not the myth that we are trying to create of ourselves along the way, because that can be just as soon as stripped away from you as, as I experienced. And like the way I'm so much more happy in my life and confident in what I'm doing as a filmmaker, n- not caring if there's any such thing as a myth of myself. Like I wouldn't even want that if, if I, if I had that handed to me, I you know, I would prefer to be uh, uh, to ask anybody for help and to admit I don't have the answers. Hmm. That's awesome. You you mentioned uh, the the voice earlier in the interview, which is interesting because I, I remember when when Spielberg was making Lincoln, there was this big question of like, how is Daniel Day Lewis going to interpret Lincoln's voice? Because there's not really any kind of recordings. And I think there was some like record of him having a very high pitched voice, which is how Daniel Day Lewis interpreted it. You had said that there's no recordings of Capone. I tried to find some on YouTube, but even the ones I found, there were people in the comments going like, that's not really him. And that's a fake recording. So I'm mm-hmm. sort of curious, like, I, so I guess that there, there are no actual recordings of El, Al Capone. And then at that point, how do you decide what he sounds like? Well, so on one level, Tom Hardy's voice is going to be Tom Hardy's voice in the way that he is going to, he's going to emote and feel it from inside of him. Right. But in terms of the actual, uh, like neighborhood accent and affectation and, and how somebody from the, you know, when Al Capone was born from the neighborhood, he was raised in, in Park Slope, Brooklyn, um, Mm -hmm. in the turn of the century, you know, what, uh, 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 in the, you know, in the, the late 1800s, like wh- who else for me, I was just like, well, I have no recording of him, but what other famous person is there a recording of who is from that neighborhood who never lost their accent? And I, Jimmy Durani came to mind, oh. uh, okay. s- Italian from Park Slope, Brooklyn, literally yeah. born within five years of Al Capone. And you listen to how Jimmy Durani talks in that accent. And it's that is, you know, I was not to, you know, like, again, what Tom did with that voice is what Tom did with that voice. There's no emulation whatsoever of Jimmy Durante. But we were sending each other recordings back and forth to find, OK, what did that neighborhood sound like? Right. So we had act, we had recordings of Jimmy Durante giving interviews. And um, uh, that, that was like, that was a good piece of research for us along the way, which is why. Uh, I loved how there was uh, an interview that Tom did at one point uh, before we started shooting Fonzo, where uh, he had brought up to an interviewer about how it was kind of like a Bugs Bunny voice. And I <laughs> thought that was hilarious because it, and by the way, it's like, it makes sense because Bugs Bunny, Jimmy Durante, Mel Blanc, I mean, all of these, that that's where that accent came from. It's, it's yeah. what a lot of those people shared in common in New York from that time period. Wow. Uh, and also the carrot, you know, yeah. which, 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 is, which is a great part of that too. Um, so there's a lot of things in this film that I would love to just break down with you at some point, because I just think the score is brilliant. I think the sound design, the way the cigar is sucked in, I just everything about the, the intricacies, the, how close we are into his face. With, it's, such, it's almost like intimate. It's very intimate experience as you watch this character. I also feel like his prison is his mind. He's basically still in prison. I mean, he's he's mm-hmm. being punished for what he did through those visions that he's having and reliving them. The stabbing in the next scene is one of the most disturbing scenes I've seen 
on film in a long time. It is just relentless and it keeps going. And what I love about that shot specifically is the cutback to Hardy and his disgust almost like, Ew, yeah. like I, I, you know, I was involved in stuff like this. How did you get that stabbing scene past the MPA in the sense of did you did you have it? Was it was it always the way it was? Did you have mm-hmm. to take any of the actual stabs no. out? Because it's pretty brutal. I you know what? Like, it's funny. It's funny that you bring that up because I never even thought about it. I just knew like, well, it's definitely rated R like, you know, <laughs> um, but I didn't know that I it. it uh, I, I'm glad we got it past the MPAA. I, 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 from what I know, I don't think that there was any um, any issue. Probably because, well, with can't give any, too, away too many spoilers, but yeah, it, it, mm-hmm. I, I didn't have any. There weren't any issues that came to to across, you know, m- you know what w- what I knew what was going on. I, I just heard we got approval, so I was like, oh great. Um, it would, uh, but that that was the intention behind the scene is. To, to make it as as traumatizing to the point where it's uh, it's goes overboard a little bit, because this is the moment that moment is the true representation of all of the violence of everything that he's been involved in in his entire mm. life in this uh, one yeah. moment and how he would how he would view that in this moment when he's has just admitted just a few scenes before he thinks he's somebody else completely. Mm. And he's really kind of shocked. He's he's nervous. You know, I mean, part of the way when we were uh, when we were filming those scenes in that part of the the movie. um, And what I love about working with Tom is just how open he is with his process with everybody. Like he's not one of those actors. He's not method. He's just incredibly skilled. He turns it off. He turns it on. He's very he's just like, you know, great like that. So when we were doing that scene, you know, his, uh, his motivation during that is like, he thinks that they have the wrong guy that they think that he's, they think he's somebody who he knows he's not, but he's Mm -hmm. just playing along with it to the best of his ability because he doesn't want them to, to, he doesn't want to be discovered. He's acting. Yeah. Yeah. He's yes. There you, yes, Kevin. Yeah, literally. <laughs> he's, he's acting. Yeah, literally. <laughs> uh, Josh, we're gonna run out of time. I'll get you out of here on this one. Um, because okay. I, I'm a diehard Spider-Man fan. I, yes. I've known for a while. You had a uh, an R-rated Venom pitch that you brought to Matt Talmack uh, back in the day. It tickles me that you got to work with Hardy, uh, who plays Eddie Brock. Yeah. And I'm just yeah. curious, is in downtime, yes. if you guys traded secrets, uh, picked over some of those ideas, uh, talked about maybe collaborating on something Venom related moving forward. Uh, did you guys talk about that at all? You know, it's funny. Cause like, obviously, yeah, I was, wor- I was working on it. So when Tom mentioned that he was going to do Venom, uh, I almost for a moment kind of was like, Oh, that makes sense. And then I was like, Oh wait, I was working on that a few years ago. <laughs> and he was just like, you were. And I was like, yeah. And then he was like, okay, and I'm like, and then that was it, you know, like then he would, <laughs> he went off and did it because he wasn't the, curious about your ideas. Well, I wasn't really interested in going too far into it because it was like, <laughs> it was just something that like, I don't know. I just didn't really, it was part of another time in my life that at that moment when he, cause I'm trying to remember the, this was, must've been in 2017 I think early 2017 when it was announced that he was going to do it Mm because that's when he came on board the project. Um, And that was only two years after the fact. And it was still a very, it was the whole situation of post fantastic four post career, all that stuff was still very fresh for me. Mm -hmm. So he knew I didn't want to really go into it either. Mm -hmm. So he didn't, he, he almost felt a little bit concerned. Like I hope this doesn't like trigger you or, you know, make you uncomfortable. And, right. and I was right. kind of like, no, of course it doesn't, because you're actually perfect for it. I told him a little bit about what I was thinking about, you know, kind of like that. And that's what it seemed like that that's what they were wanted to do anyway, but not rated R. Um, right. But like I've said, I mean, I, I still haven't seen the movie itself just because up until just a, you know, what a few months ago, I've just been working on a, my own Tom Hardy film. So it, <laughs> I, I wanted to kind of avoid seeing too much of what else he was doing. Um, 
But it's a better Tom Hardy film. With all due respect to Tom Hardy. Yes. <laughs> yes. I agree. I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy. I'm just I am here. excited about Andy Serkis's movie. I think Andy uh, Serkis might do well. M- me yes. too. Andy Serkis is one of the coolest guys. One of the most Agreed. talented guys. I, I'm. I'm really excited about that too. Very nice. Well, we have to let you go. Um, we you have a lot of other press to get to, but you are welcome oh. back on this show anytime, yeah, Josh. We really I really want to. I want to get it done. I would love nothing more than to just come back and just talk about movies in general. I mean, yeah. Kevin. I, I've talked to Kevin a lot. Just we not even about this movie, just about movies in yeah. general. And I think that uh, if I just say anything, like you know, the one thing about all of us being on social media and what we've all been calling like film Twitter. You know, I I think that it kind of sucks in a way because I've really gotten a great opportunity over the last week to actually speak to a lot of people who I've never met before, who I just know through their names or their Twitter accounts. And everybody just loves movies. And just, you know, I think that it's 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 a nice opportunity for all of us as film lovers in a film community to kind of like have more opportunities to get together to just talk about how much we love movies because I I feel like an old like the old person saying this all the time but I feel like there are just young people out there who really do need to have some sort of like a more of a community positive sort of conversation that they can tune into to hear filmmakers talking with you know all sorts of people about movies and you guys I feel like are just such a positive force behind you know, talking about movies and getting movies out there and and promoting films. And, you know, I just wish that there was more of this going on as opposed to all of the like banter and stuff that usually tends to happen. You know, we say the same thing all the time. This is literally why we do the show. We just want to talk movies, man. That's all we give a shit about. You know what I mean? Please have me back. I'm down. Thank you so much to Josh Trank for coming on the Real Blend Podcast. I thought that was a really great conversation, and he's an excellent guest. Welcome back here anytime. Now, of course, with this being a bonus episode, uh, we will have a full episode of the show later on this week where we get to play all of our normal games, dive into the latest news that's come through. We'll play a blend game. Um, And if you're watching us here on YouTube, make sure to give us a subscribe down below because we're always putting the show up on the YouTube channel now too. But if you want to listen to us where uh, podcasts are downloaded and streamed, you can find us on all of the different from portals that you use to download uh, your favorite podcasts and make sure you subscribe to us on those devices as well too so we will be back with more real blend very soon so keep it right here and of course dunkirk